welcome to Science Unwrapped. Thanks a lot for coming out on what is our maybe last beautiful fall evening, right before the weekend storm. Uh, my name is Greg Podgorski. I'm the Associate Dean in the College of Science. But for these events, uh, it, it's way more important that I have the privilege of chairing the Science Unwrapped Committee. And uh, we've got a really good lineup for you this year. So Dr. Kimberly Hageman will be our speaker tonight. Uh, Kim will be speaking on chemical commuters, so how pollutants travel far and wide through the Earth's atmosphere. We have another talk coming up really soon on November 4th. This will be a talk by Rob Davies, and it's on the fantasies of continuous growth, uh, saying the quiet part out loud. So that'll be a really good talk on November 4th. In this event, there are a lot of people that make this possible. And, uh, and you know, I'm a, a tiny, tiny piece of this, so I want to thank the Science Unwrapped Committee, and I really want to thank all our volunteers who put on our after-talk hands-on science activities. So please, please take advantage of those activities after the talk. We really have a lot of volunteer groups that put in a, a ton of effort, and it's, it's an equally, you know, ton of fun. So, so please uh, take advantage of those talks. Okay, I want to give uh, a fairly quick, but maybe not too quick, introduction to uh, Dr. Kim Hageman. I've gotten to know Kim a little bit through this talk and a little bit through other interactions that we've uh, had over the last few years. Uh, Kim has a really interesting history. She's moved around a lot. So Kim is a native of Bozeman, Montana. And she stayed in Bozeman for the first 12 years of her life before her family moved to Ohio. A move she said she hardly has gotten over forgiving her parents for. But I think Kim has forgiven her parents and uh, spent the later part of her childhood in Ohio and actually went to school at Kenyon College in Ohio. After that, and she got a degree in environmental chemistry, and as we'll see, that's what Kim does yet today. Kim traveled around a lot. Uh, Kim went to Alaska, to North Dakota, to South Africa, okay, before uh, deciding she wanted to go back and get her PhD. So after eight years, if my calculations are right, wandering in something other than the desert, Kim went back to the West Coast to Oregon State University, where she got her PhD in analytical chemistry. She did a postdoc at Oregon State University following her PhD, and then, keeping in the spirit of travel, Kim accepted a faculty position at the University of Otago in New Zealand. And that's a long way off. And I had to look up Otago. It turns out Otago was not a town, but it is a region of New Zealand, and it sounds awfully nice. So, taking it from the, uh, the travel log. So Otago is a southeastern region on New Zealand's South Island. Its terrain encompasses snow-capped mountains, glacial lakes, and a rugged peninsula sheltering sandy beaches and wildlife such as penguins. That sounds pretty good. It's a hot spot for bungee jumping and paragliding too, and uh, I bet Kim took advantage of a lot of those things while in Otago. But it's a long way off from the States, and Kim decided in 2018 to, uh, to head back stateside, and lucky for us, she came to Utah State University. So Kim came as an associate professor, was, but fairly recently was promoted to full professor. So congratulations, Kim. Um, Kim will tell you her story tonight, and I've probably gone on long enough, but a few things I'd like to share is that uh, Kim loves to hike, she rides her bike, she loves to garden, and she has a hive of blue bonnet orchard bees that she tents. So I'll let you take it away. Okay, so Kim Hagen, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for that introduction. Is the sound okay, my voice? I can bump it up. Okay, well, I am really pleased to be here tonight. Thank you all for coming. Before I start, I actually want to thank the graduate students and undergraduate students who are in my research group 
So they're mainly over here, maybe a few more spread out. So please stand up. I just want to make sure everyone knows that these people are so important to making research happen at USU. And while I'm at it, are there any other graduate students or undergraduate students working in any labs here in this room? If you are, just stand up. I just want everyone to thank all of you for what you do for USU. Any other graduate students? Colleen? <laughs> Anyone else? OK. OK, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, I want to talk about pollutants and some of their properties. We're going to touch on a topic called toxicology. And we're going to talk about what happens to these pollutants in the environment. And then I'm going to talk about a little bit of my current research in Arctic Alaska. Now I'm going to be asking all of you some questions tonight. I'm going to start off with a couple questions here. So when I ask questions, please do participate. Please raise your hand, and I'll call on some of you to uh, help me make this uh, conversation interesting tonight. So I have a question here. Has anyone in this room touched a chemical today? So everybody, raise your hand if you've touched a chemical. OK, all right, some of you have. Has anybody breathed a chemical today? OK, some of you, good. Has anyone eaten a chemical today? OK, good. Now, I think most of you are indicating with those raised hands that you know that chemicals are really all around us, right? Everything is made of chemicals, so I'm glad that most of you know that. So things to know about chemicals. They're all around us. All of the solids, liquids, and gases are chemicals, right? So our air is even chemicals. So does anyone in this room know what are some of the most abundant chemicals in the air? Raise your hand if anyone has, a, has an idea. OK, yes. Excellent. Nitrogen in particular, that's the most abundant chemical in the atmosphere. I've got another hand up over here. Most abundant chemical in the universe is hydrogen. OK, hydrogen. OK. In, in the air that we breathe here, so you're talking about the universe. In the air we breathe, the second most common one is oxygen. But also, our bodies are made out of chemicals. So here's a little image that shows what the main elements are in our bodies. So we have oxygen, carbon, water. Those are the most common elements in our bodies. Of course, the hydrogen and the oxygen come together to make water. So we have a lot of water in our bodies. But the main point is chemicals. They're all around us. And let's get to something important here, chocolate cake. All right, so here are a few of the chemicals in chocolate cake. Now. I want everyone in this room to leave today knowing that most chemicals are healthy and safe, but there are some that are harmful. Now, my job as an environmental chemist is to study the harmful, chemist, the harmful chemicals. So we're going to talk about some of those harmful ones today. And some of the terms that we use for harmful chemicals are poisons, pollutants, toxins, or contaminants. So when you hear those words, we're talking about the harmful chemicals. And the image on the right on this slide shows us that there's many different types of harms. So some chemicals may be harmful to human health, others to environmental health. Some are flammable. Some might cause explosions. OK, so there's different types of potential harm. OK, I said we were going to talk about toxicology. So this is a big word. It means the study of toxins, in particular in our body. So how do these bad chem chemicals cause problems with our health? That's what toxicology is about in its essence. So there's two types of toxicity. First, we have the acute toxicity. This is harm that is caused immediately or soon after contact with the chemical. 
So bleach, this would be a good example. If you get bleach on your skin, it's going to immediately cause some irritation. And this is why you should wear gloves when you're, wearing, when you're working with bleach. The second type of toxicity is called chronic toxicity. So this is when the harm occurs long after the exposure or after long-term exposure. So this might occur if you've been exposed to a chemical for many years or even just many months, maybe for your whole lifetime. So you may be exposed to these chemicals for a long time before you realize that there's any harm. Also, these chemicals can increase the likelihoods of diseases like cancers or diabetes or respiratory problems. Now, the important thing to know about the chronic chemicals, the ones that cause chronic toxicity, is that we might ignore their effects because we don't see those effects immediately. But we really shouldn't do that because they could be deadly in the long term. So one type of pollution that we are concerned about right here in Logan is the air pollution. All right, so first of all, before I go any further, why don't you talk with your neighbor for a second and see if you can decide, is the air pollution a form of chronic toxicity or acute toxicity? So take a second to discuss that and I'll get someone to answer this in just a couple seconds. Okay, okay, let's see. Who wants to give me an answer here? Great, yes, yeah, up there. <laughs> Chronic, exactly. All right, so most of the time if we walk outside and we start breathing some contaminated air, it's not going to affect us immediately. I mean, we're gonna, not gonna fall over on the sidewalk when we breathe the toxic contaminated air. However, if we breathe that contaminated air year after year after year, that's going to start to cause problems. So this is why we worry about the air pollution in places like Cache Valley. How about, does anyone have any ideas about how we could reduce the problems with air pollution right here in Cache Valley? Let me see, uh, you in the back. Say again? Electric vehicles, Kim. Electric vehicles, fantastic, I love that idea. Anybody else have an idea? Okay. Why don't we just stop creating pollution? Stop creating pollution, okay, good. Uh, I was gonna say encourage the use of bikes. Bikes, okay, good, anything else? Uh, okay, here. Public transportation, okay. There are actually a lot of things that we can do to reduce the pollution right here in um, Logan. One thing that none of you mentioned was to not idle your cars, right? So when you have your car parked, please turn off the car and then start it again when it's time to go. This makes a huge difference. Mark. I thought parting cows were a problem. Okay, that's true too. So. Um, watch out for those farting cows. Actually, the, it's mainly the belching that is the problem. It's a mis, uh, misconception that it's the farting, it's really the belching. <laughs> okay, um, but speaking of air pollution, I just wanna thank all those Utah high schoolers who are creating these posters, trying to convince people to uh, stop idling and also ride your bikes, take the bus. We have free buses in Logan if you don't know that. Okay, let's move on here. So when we talk about toxicology, we need to mention Paracelsus. He was a Swiss physician, and he is famous as being the father of toxicology, and he's famous for this quote, the dose makes the poison. Now again, I want you to talk to your neighbor and think about what does this actually mean, the dose makes the poison. And you can use this image here on the slide to help you think about what this quote means. So take just a couple seconds here and talk to your neighbor about what does this quote actually mean. Move it up.
Okay, great. First of all, can everyone hear me okay? No? Can we turn it up more? I think your mask's falling, but you move a little closer to your mouth. How about now? Okay, all right. I will just hold it here. So, I need someone to tell me what this quote means. Who wants to explain that? Go ahead. Right, exactly. So, in many cases, chemicals are perfectly healthy when there's just a small amount that we're in contact with or that we consume. But as we have more and more in our diet or that get into our bodies, it will cause a problem. Absolutely. Okay, one more thing I want to mention about chemicals is that they can be beneficial or harmful, like the same chemical could be beneficial or harmful depending on the situation. So one great example is ozone. So ozone is a good chemical when it's in our upper atmosphere, and that's because it absorbs the UV radiation uh, coming from the sun, the damaging radiation. But it's also present near the surfaces of the earth uh, at the ground level where we can breathe it. And it's created from traffic pollution. And when it's here and we're breathing it, it can cause damage to our respiratory system and it's also an eye irritant. So again, it's good when it's high up in the atmosphere, in the stratosphere, but it's bad when we're breathing it. We can think of lots of examples like this. Bleach again, let's go back and complain about bleach. Again, it's very useful to clean your toilet, but you don't want to get it on your skin or on your brand new jeans, right? That's happened to me. Okay, so moving on. Okay, next question for everybody. What is wrong with these images? So talk to your neighbor for just a second. I want you to take a look at these images and then tell me what irritates me about these kinds of statements. Okay, good. Let's get an answer here. Okay, what's wrong with these statements? Oh, in the back there. Chemicals are everywhere, so what in the world does this mean? What is a chemical-free kid? Give me a break, okay? So it really irritates me as an environmental chemist when I see this kind of statement. Of course, people mean free of harmful chemicals or free of nasty chemicals, but there is no such thing as chemical-free coconut oil. There is no such thing as a chemical-free park. This is ridiculous. So I want everyone in this room to help me tell people that this does not make sense. There are harmful chemicals, but chemical-free, that does not make sense. All right, now we've gotten this far along, and I haven't actually told you what environmental chemistry is. So, again, I am an environmental chemist. I love environmental chemistry. But what is it? Well, it is the study of chemicals, actually both the good and the bad ones, in the environment. Now, I've included this diagram here, first of all, because nitrogen, in most situations, is one of, a good, one of the good chemicals. All right, I, of course, too much nitrogen in the environment can also cause harm. Now, what we can see, though, in this diagram is that there's a cycle, and we can see that there are different forms of nitrogen. So we have um, nitrogen that is, ah, here we go, nitrogen bound to three hydrogens converted to nitrogen bound to three oxygens, for example. So in this nitrogen cycle, we can see that there are 
various forms of nitrogen. And in this case, it's bacteria that are making these changes to the form of nitrogen in the environment. So as environmental chemists, we're really interested in these changes in chemical forms, and we're interested in how chemicals move around the environment and what these cycles are. Okay, I'm gonna actually spend the rest of this lecture talking about what happens to harmful chemicals that are released into the environment from human activities. So one thing I want you to know is that most pollutants in the environment will actually break down into safer chemicals. Now some of these reactions, this breakdown process, can happen slowly, and in some cases it will happen uh, quickly. It just depends on the chemical and the situation. All right, let me give you an example here. So if we have chemicals in oil from an oil spill that are released into the ocean, they will eventually break apart into water and carbon dioxide. All right, now this is gonna take a long time, but we do eventually have the chemicals break into safer components. So this image here is of a, a droplet of oil, and you can see that there are many different specific chemicals in oil. However, if we add some oxygen and microorganisms, again, eventually, after many, many years, those compounds in the oil will break apart and become water and carbon dioxide, which are safe. So that's good to know, right? It's good to know that chemicals will actually eventually break down in the environment. So this is a type of transformation, like what we were looking at in that nitrogen cycle. Let's talk about plastics for a second, though. So plastics, they will eventually break down into safe chemicals. However, check out the number of years here in this diagram. A water bottle, 450 years. Coffee cup, 30 years. Plastic spoon, 20 years. Look, plastic breaks down very, very slowly. And most of the time, when plastics are added to the environment, they break down just into smaller pieces of plastics, okay? So nowadays, we talk a lot about microplastics. So microplastics are very, very small pieces of plastics, ones that we can't even see, but that are in the environment. And there are even smaller ones that we call nanoplastics. So these are not plastics that have actually broken down into water and carbon dioxide. These are just small pieces of plastic. And those are now known to be everywhere in our environment. So does anyone here have an idea about how to reduce the amount of plastic in the environment? Is there anything that we can do ourselves? Let's see, someone who hasn't answered up there. Recycle. Recycle, great. Recycle plastic, I love that. What else? You. Okay, I love that too. Bra engineer plastics that break down easier, but how about you? Um, use compostable plastics, plastics. yep. Yeah. Back there. Again. Yes, use reusable things instead of plastic. So bring your cloth bag to the grocery store. There's so many things that we can each do every day to reduce the amount of plastic that ends up in the environment. What's the life cycle of nanoplastics? Oh, they also take hundreds of years to, to truly break down into carbon dioxide and water. So even though they're very small, they still will last a long time. Yep, yep.
Now, I'm working with a company actually called Natural Fiber Welding, and one of my students here is working with this company. And they're doing exactly what someone in this room suggested. They are working on making new types of materials that can replace our traditional plastics. So this is, I think it's really gonna be our future is these alternative types of plastics and fabrics that are not based on petroleum products, but based on plant components. So this is what's coming up in our future and I'm very happy about that. Yeah. Equal to the strength. Oh, equal to the strength. Okay, well, this is an active research area, so actually our collaborators are doing experiments to determine are these other types of, you know, plant-based plastics, are they as strong? Do they last as long? But this company is already selling their plastics to BMW and companies that make shoes. So it's, it, it, it's out there already. Look for it. Okay, let's go back to talking about chemical behavior. So every chemical that gets out there into the environment is gonna have a slightly different behavior. They're going to break down at different rates and they're gonna move around in the environment differently. So any chemical we can dream up, they'll all behave just a little bit differently. However, we can classify chemicals into four general categories. So here we're gonna talk about behavior of chemicals. And I'm just gonna use some animals to help us understand this. So our first category, now we're talking about types of chemicals here. So the first category of chemicals I wanna tell you about are the flyers. Okay, this is what I'm calling them, the flyers. So what part of the environment do you think we find these types of chemicals, the flyers. Okay, good, I got a hand up right here quickly. Uh, airborne. airborne, excellent. So the flyers are chemicals that are mainly in the air. And they're ones that once they're released to the environment, they stay in the air. So those are the flyers. All right, now, what do you guys think here? Remember the title of this talk? chemical commuters. So do flyers have a tendency to travel long distances from where they started? Do you think that if we release some flyers into the air here, they might actually end up far away? Raise your hand if you think yes. Yeah, of course. So the air is moving, and so it can also bring chemicals with it, okay? so. If there's a industrial plant in Salt Lake City and the winds come along, it can blow those chemicals right up here to Logan. Or we know that when there are wildfires in California, we end up breathing that smoke, right? We call this atmospheric transport of contaminants. Here's an example of a flyer chemical, carbon dioxide. So this is a very classic type of flyer. So this is produced um, from the burning of coal or other fuel oils, also during metal smelting, and it's a precursor to acid rain. So this is an example, flyer chemical. And as we move through the four types of chemicals, you'll see I'm giving you an example in each case and a couple of fun facts. So I'm not going to tell you those fun facts. You can read those yourself when I move on to those different slides. Okay, our second class of chemicals are the swimmers. So where in the environment do we find the swimmers? You. Yes, rivers and oceans and lakes. So in the water, absolutely. So these are chemicals that are found in water that will stay in water once they get there. So will these chemicals travel long distances from where they started? What do you think? 
Will our swimmers move around? Somebody raise your hand. Okay, back there. Yes, okay, yes. Because water also flows, just like air. Not as quickly, but water does also flow. And so it will move chemicals around in the environment. So if we were to accidentally release some swimmer type chemicals into the Logan River, where are they going to end up? In the Great Salt Lake, that's right. So the Logan River flows into Cutler Reservoir and then into the Bear River and that flows into the Great Salt Lake. Now the Great Salt Lake is a terminal basin lake and so that means there's no outflow and so once these pollutant chemicals get into the Great Salt Lake, they will just stay there until they degrade. All right, now in other parts of the world, your answer would have been that chemicals will eventually make it down to the ocean. That's not true here. Here our chemicals will go into the Great Salt Lake and they'll stay there. Okay, our third type of chemical is the crawlers. Where are the crawlers found? Okay, up there at the back. In the soil, good. All right, crawlers are found in the soil. And do these chemicals travel long distances? Okay, um, up there in the blue. Not really. not really, that's the right answer, not really. So soil does not flow in the way that water or air does. So these chemicals will pretty much stay where we put them in the environment. Now that doesn't mean that they don't cause problems. For example, a lot of our Superfund sites are filled with contaminated soils or sediments, but at least the slightly good thing is at least they stay where we put them and they don't move far distances like those swimmers and flyers. Okay, we're gonna talk about our last type of chemical these are the hoppers. So the hoppers are very special. So the hoppers can be found in soil or water, but they will also hop up into the atmosphere, into the air, when the temperatures are warm. But they'll come back down into soil or water when the temperatures are cold. So these ones, again, they go up into the atmosphere when it's warm. Maybe the winds are gonna move them around a little bit and then they're gonna come back down. Now note especially my snowflake there and the raindrop. So the snowflakes act as a filter and they pull those chemicals out of the atmosphere back into the surface and those chemicals can accumulate in the snow. But nonetheless, they hop up into the atmosphere and they come back down, maybe with the snow, maybe with the rain, maybe just as dry chemicals. Can these chemicals travel long distances from where they started? Yep. Yeah, okay, these ones can too. But what we wanna realize is that these are a little different than the flyers. So the flyers, they just stay in the atmosphere. So they may be dangerous when we breathe them, but they'll always be in the atmosphere. The hoppers, they go into the atmosphere and then they come back down. So they can still, even though they travel, they still end up in our lakes, in our rivers, and in our soil. So the type of harm that they cause can be quite different than for the flyers. Okay, so as a review, we have the flyers. They are in the air. We have the swimmers. They are in the water. And we have our crawlers in the soil and our hoppers, which are actually found in all of those matrices, but they're still moving around. So what I wanna do now is a little activity to help demonstrate the way that these chemicals move and something to help make sure everybody remembers these four types of chemicals. So if you are less than 20, I wanna see you right up here next to me in front of the room. Come on up, come up quickly.
Come on up. Okay, you all are awesome. I love it. Okay, so if you are less than 10, you are going to be a flyer. If you are between 10 and 15, you're going to be a swimmer. Any um, one between 15 and 20, you're a hopper. And everyone else in the room who hasn't moved up to the front, you're a crawler. Okay? <laughs> so when, I, when my slide says go, you're going to replicate the behavior of your chemical. So the flyers, you're going to move to the back of the room. You have to move your arms like this. You can walk quickly, but no running. Swimmers, you're going to have to do a swimming movement. You can walk slowly. The crawlers, you can bounce in your seat like this, because of course, all chemicals are moving, even if you're in the soil or if you're a solid. And uh, the hoppers, you get to hop up these stairs. OK? Yeah. Let, OK, let me answer a question, and then we'll start. Why don't you um, why don't you be a swimmer? So what do I do? You're gonna make a swimming motion and you're gonna walk slowly to the back. So like up there. Just slowly, yeah. Anybody else have a question about how this is gonna work? Um, what do I be? You will be a flyer. Okay, so you're gonna fly you're gonna make a flying motion and you're gonna walk quickly up the stairs to the back. Okay? Got it? Everyone got it? Crawlers, understand your job? OK, go. OK, stop, 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 stop. OK, now let's look around and see what we have. All right, anyone want to make an observation about what happened? <laughs> what did you say? said the room is polluted. The room is, oh, the room is polluted, yes. It's very polluted. All right, any other observations? This is what scientists do, right? They observe what happened after they do an experiment. You down there. Yeah, okay. So, but especially, the, it looks to me like the flyers made it up to the back of the room, some of the flyers did. Our hoppers were a little bit slower, and, uh, and our swimmers were kind of in, in the middle, or at least that was what I was hoping would happen. It's a little bit mixed up, but that's OK. So that's what we wanted to see was that each of these chemicals, if we, if we had a spill of flyers, swimmers, and hoppers down here at the front of the room, they would all be moving through the environment, but at different speeds, right? So after a certain amount of time, we'd have a different distribution of our types of chemicals. So everybody, go ahead and sit down. Thank you. Okay, so my research group's focus is mainly on the hoppers. Okay, quiet, all of you swimmers and flyers and hoppers. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit more about hoppers. Why do we care so much about hoppers? Well, these chemicals can hop right on up to remote places like the Arctic. They can hop into the mountains. And so this means that we find these types of chemicals in places where we don't expect to find pollution, like in our most remote places in the world, our pristine environments, right? And so this has concerned me in my life. This is why I have been working on these chemicals for the last 20 years, because we expect those places in our mountains and the Arctic to be clean. But no, they contain 
these types of chemicals that can move through the distance, these commuters. The other thing is that it means that our activities in our own backyards can be affecting places far away. So we need to be careful what we do. It doesn't only affect us, it can affect places many miles away, maybe hundreds of miles away. So I've been working on this topic for 20 years, as I said. My first project involved measuring pesticides in national parks in the US. I was in New Zealand for 11 years, and I measured these contaminants in the mountains there. I had a student go to Antarctica. I didn't get to go, but she went. And currently, we're looking at contaminants moving from Salt Lake City or the Great Salt Lake into the Wasatch Range. So let's talk just for a few minutes about the research we're doing up in the Arctic. Our research is at Tulik Lake. We get there by flying into Fairbanks, right in there somewhere, and driving on a dirt road for nine hours. That's how we get to our research station. You can see a photo of our research station here. Over, to, uh, over on this slide, there's our research station. You can see what the landscape looks like there. It's absolutely beautiful. The mountain range there is the Brooks Range. And here's a couple of photos of what it's like to be working at the research station. So here's me carrying around our water sampler. I'm going to introduce you to the water sampler here in a minute. In the back there is our lab, chemistry lab, that white truck is the truck that we got to drive around. You can see a little bit what it's like there. This was my sleeping quarters here, 9S. So it's very fun to be working up at this research station because there's people studying all kinds of Arctic science there. And you sit down at dinner and you learn about wolverines in the Arctic, or you learn about the plants in the Arctic, or some of the chemistry going on up there. So we already know that some toxic chemicals travel through the atmosphere to the Arctic. In this project, we want to know what happens to them when they get there. Remember I said that snow is a main mechanism for bringing these chemicals out of the atmosphere. So we want to know what happens to those chemicals when the snow melts. We're looking at um, some of the uh, pesticides and flame retardants that we know travel long distances up to the Arctic. And we did sampling of the air and of the water in two different places here. We started sampling just this summer, last, last spring, 2022 in mid-April. You can see the water sampler there. It's sitting on the ice. In early June, we had kind of a mixture of ice and water in the lake. And then by uh, early July, we stopped the sampling after all of that ice and snow had melted. OK, I, I wanted to introduce you to my samplers. So you can see that red box sitting over there. That is Elmo, meet Elmo. That's the water sampler. And this is our air sampler. She's named Gertrude. And this is the PhD student. His name's Jeffrey. <laughs> All right. <laughs> OK, so I'm just going to tell you quickly how the water sampler works and the water and the air sampler works in a similar way. So in this um, box, in the red box, Elmo, there's a pump. And there's a sorbent and a filter, and those are traps. So when the water flows through those, the chemicals that are in the water that we're interested in, they get stuck there. They get trapped there. And then we ship those traps back to our lab here at Utah State to determine the concentrations in the water. Now, we pump a lot of water through these, 500 liters, in fact. So that's about the volume of 10 of those red boxes. And we pump all that water through those traps. And the reason we do that is that we want to just ship those traps back to USU and not have to send samples of 500 liter water samples back to USU. We're also building a chemical fate model. This is very complicated, but I just wanted to show it to you because we're interested in all these different processes that affect the contaminants in the Arctic. And their model is going to help us understand that and also help us to predict how things are going to change with climate change. Finally, why do we do this work? Why do we care about pollutants in the Arctic? First of all, the pollutants can also end up in the tissues of organisms. 
and the concentrations get higher and higher as you go up the food web. So the predatory animals have the highest concentrations. We call this biomagnification, also a very big word. So we're worried about these large predatory animals, the bears, polar bears, foxes that are also um, carnivores, all the other interesting animals up there in the Arctic, and also the people who are eating these animals in the Arctic and also um, getting some of these atmospherically transported chemicals in their diet. Okay, so I just wanna end here with a couple of take home messages. Number one, everything is made of chemicals. Most of those are safe, but some of those are harmful and we wanna know about those harmful ones. Each chemical behaves a little differently. We can think about them as flyers, swimmers, crawlers, and hoppers. And then some of those harmful ones travel through the atmosphere to the Arctic. So uh, Elmo and Gertrude are up here. Jeffrey's gonna come down here too. So after I'm done answering your questions, come down and Jeffrey and I will show you how the samplers work. Please don't go out there and do the activities yet. Come down and meet Elmo and Gertrude and Jeffrey and we'll just show you a little bit more about these samplers and then go out there and enjoy all those activities. So thank you so much and um, I'd love to answer some questions. Questions? Okay. I'm going to throw this up. It's football season. Are you good catch? I'm a really bad throw. Ready? Yeah, you're a good catch. Um, so going back to the thing concerning plastic, what about those like bacteria and the species of worm that can digest plastic? So you're asking if the bacteria will help degrade the plastics? Well, I'm just wondering like, how um, plausible is it that we could use those plastic? How plausible it is that bacteria will degrade the plastics? Well, the spe there are specific bacteria that can decompose the plastic. Sure, Without okay. producing micro and nanoplastic. Good question. Um, absolutely right. I think the um, microorganisms in the environment do speed up the degradation of the plastic compounds too, but nonetheless, um, the degradation rates, the breakdown rates are very slow. Now with some of our alternative plastics that are being developed, the idea is that those should break down faster. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. This is a fun thing. Yeah. Um, you were talking about microplastics. I read recently that they were actually detected microplastics in breast milk. And so our tiniest humans are getting microplastics from almost when they're born. Well, if you bre breastfeed. But um, do we know anything about the, what that causes, like how, detrimental effects of that? Is that being studied anywhere? Or because you have to study on mothers and babies, that's just not something that they do? Right, good question. So if you didn't hear, the question is, you know, do we know how detrimental <clears throat> microplastics are when they're in our bodies? And this is a topic of research right now. So it's really only in the last few years that we have discovered that plastics are really embedded in our bodies. And so, to be honest, scientists and regulators, researchers don't know. People are working on this right now to try to determine how bad that actually is. So some of the bigger plastics will pass right through, but there's more and more recent evidence that the really small plastics can get into cells, into tissues, into our lungs. There's a lot of hypotheses about the type of damage that could cause, but but we don't we don't know. Yeah. We have a question over here. Do you have a mic? Oh good. 
Um, am I made out of chemicals? Tell me again. Am I made out of chemicals? Am I made out of chemicals? Are you made of chemicals? You are totally made of chemicals. Yep. <laughs> You're made of the good ones, though. Yeah. You're made of lots of chemicals. Water and proteins. Yeah. Carbohydrates. Yep. Everybody is. Everybody's made of chemicals. Whoops. Are you ready? Thanks for asking. Yep. Okay. My question is, did you actually ever know where, like, the, the, what was it, is it pollution? The pollution is? Or did, or were you just guessing? Oh, okay. All right. The question is, do I know where the pollution is, or am I just guessing? Okay. I like that question. That's good. So, you know what? My research group, those students who stood up, this is our job, is to measure the pollution. And so we have a chemistry lab upstairs in this building. You can come visit me someday, and I'll show you how we do the measurements. So we are not guessing. We are measuring those chemicals up there. And yeah, talk to me, and you can come, come visit my lab. OK, who's next? Any others? Okay, what I'll do then is I want to thank Dr. Hageman one more time.